I want to introduce Philippe Archambault. He's from the University of Quebec. He has his son with him in the back there, <laughs> who's joining us this afternoon because they're rushing off to meet the new California state law about vaccines in schools. So <laughs> he's been introduced to our country. He um, is visiting at Hopkins for the next year. So it was not, I met him last year at the Benthic Ecology meetings and it's really nice to have him here and talking about the breadth of his research. He comes from um, Montreal and he went to the University of Montreal, did his PhD at Laval University and a postdoc with Tony Underwood in Australia and is now a professor at um, University of Quebec. And I'm gonna keep it short and let him talk about the breadth of what he's interested in, but he's leaving next week on an Arctic um, icebreaker to look at benthic ecology up in the Arctic. He has a wide range of papers from aquaculture in which he might be speaking later, either in the semester or next semester about aquaculture. And, um, but also he's really interested in, has a, um, a lot of research interest in benthic diversity. So a lot of people talk about yeah. that and have that as part of their research. And so using him to look at the various approaches that you're using in your research or other people are in trying to address uh, biodiversity, um, I suggest you visit him. He may also come back here during the winter yeah. to, to stay. He's also on an editor for MAPS and PLOS One in aquaculture. So if you're admitting a, uh, submitting a paper, Talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> but we welcome. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for uh, having me and so many people in this afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And just at the start, I want to say that I'm going to be around for one year. I don't have the time to stay because I need to go to straight to the doctor to get some vaccine to my kids. Uh, but. My email will be here. I can leave it to you. My email, don't hesitate. It's 20 minutes. My goal during the year, it's not to create my own personal project. It's to interact with the people. And I will say we have a French expression which said, uh, stop to be in your slipper all the time. Till your slipper are easy to stay there. It's easy. So my goal by doing the sabbatical here, it's to meet people, ch exchange idea, and create a new network, not only with people, but also in my head to create some new idea. Then, stop doing what I'm used to do the way I'm doing it. I think there's plenty of people, great expertise around the world, especially here in the area. And that's one of my goals during the year to learn and also exchange some idea uh, in both sides if it's possible. So don't hesitate. I can come back here at any time. It's just not that close, 25 minutes, less than that. So that was my introduction. Uh, I hesitate to talk about aquaculture, but Diana said go for uh, Arctic research. So why there's, uh, I'm talking about Arctic research and why there's this, presently I will call that the Arctic rush. There was the gold rush at some tier, now it's the Arctic rush. One of this reason, it's the substantial investment in all these companies. These famous Lloyd uh, insurance company based in London, they created this uh, report in summer 2012. And over the next five years to 10 years, they said all the industry are going to invest 100 uh, billion dollar only in the Arctic that exclude all government investment so it seems in the Arctic it's a real big target Korea got a ice breaker China got a ice breaker there's no ice there at all uh, there's a lot of country going for the Arctic now there's a lot of reason first there's the Arctic Council built I'm just going to do a small political and ethical um, overview why the Arctic is just this target presently for everyone. It's not only about science, it's cool science doing there, but the main goal, sorry, it's probably not science, the first goal, it's all economy and policy, political issues. But I just want to broad, make a, an overview of this. So there's a few countries, there's um, eight countries in the Arctic Council, uh, the one with water, it's Russia, Canada, Denmark, Norway, and the United States, United States take over the Arctic Council last year in Canada, it was Canada, and the Arctic Council, it's how we rule the Arctic among all these different countries. Some other countries want to take part of this, like Germany, like China, but so far it's only the country who owns a piece of their land and their water in the Arctic who can sit on this council. Why also, it's, if you look at this map, so that's, you can see Canada and Alaska, I don't know if you have a, a pointer around. 
Uh, you'll see then usually if you go from New York to Tokyo through the Canana, Canama, Can, Panama Canal, it's around 12,000 uh, kilometer or 11,000 miles. But suddenly, if you go by the Northwest Passage, straight in the middle of the Arctic, the Canadian Arctic, you're saving close to 4,000 miles. That means time, money, and a lot of um, rapidly you're sending your your TV or whatever on the market rapidly. So that's why these companies are really, really looking to. And there's even now a really, really big um, project from London to Tokyo for the stock market. Even if it's by satellite, there's a lot of break in the satellite. They want to use a huge fiber, uh, optic fiber and cross the Northwest Passage down to Tokyo, down to London to be sure there is no break at all, no, not even millisecond of break. That's their goal to have a complete, and that's going to be through the Canadian Arctic. But also there's a high potential for oil and gas. I don't know if there's some Canadian in the room, but I don't want to talk about policy or politic, but our former government is just looking for oil and gas. And there's a lot of oil and gas in Baffin along here, all these great shading zones. So again, Arctic, it's a lot of resources. And because of all these resources, recently there was this uh, claim about the EE zone. And all these, the area with dash lines, sorry. Thanks. I just hope it's not red. OK, good. I cannot see red and blue. Sorry, I'm colorblind. <laughs> so, um, so all these region here, it's like um, there's some debate who's going to own it. There's a little part between Alaska and Canada, or US and Canada, just here. And it's all the region with the oil, high oil and gas uh, potential. Same thing, a different area. So there's a lot, and also the two routes on both sides. Canada, so far, every country agreed on the land. It's a Canadian land, but they don't agree. They said that this Northwest Passage should be international. And there's already some country who try just in a political way to cross. Germany crossed two times last year with their ice breaker without asking any permission to Canadian land or to the Canadian authority. They just crossed to show, that's not your passage. Look, we can go there without you knowing. So there's a country trying. There's a lot of political issue here. Uh, this is why Canada tried to invest a little bit more. But I just try, you will see some fact about Canada. But we're only 32 million. So it's less than California population for the second largest country in the world. So that's not easy to put our money in everywhere, and especially in the Arctic, which is far from uh, most of the people uh, living, the citizens of Canada. So, but when you claim, and this is, you will see where the science come into play, and this is why, as a scientist, we receive quite a lot of uh, amount of money, is because of when you claim a zone, you need to show then you can rescue everyone in this zone, and it's a safety, though all the chart, the hydrographic chart, you need to do that. So Canada invests a lot to do that. You need to show that you occupy the zone with some citizen, which is the case. We have plenty of Inuit villages since a long time living there. You need to be able to enforce regulation, military. If there's some fishing regulation, every time create some MPAs and show that there's no activities in that of these MPAs. And eventually, no ledge of, and I call that nature, that's the big word they're using. It's basically the environment, your biology, the animal, the ecology, everything. And this is where most of the marine biologists come into play because it's quite huge and Canada need to know a little bit more if they want to claim some of these area. But the Arctic, it's complex. I don't know. I know there's a few working at least in Antarctica, maybe some in the Arctic, but just a, a one-on-one crash course uh, here. Uh, we have a warm current entering the Arctic here along Norway. So with a lot of species coming from the Atlantic, and we have some cold water getting the Pacific through between Alaska and uh, Russia just here. But all these water getting inside of the Arctic need to get out somewhere. So, and this water get on here, cold water getting on along um, Greenland and along the side of Canada, the Labrador. And over the last few years, you probably heard that New York, Boston receive a lot of snow every year. It's colder and colder in this area. And this is why some of your politicians use uh, some of these pictures of what happening close there to say there's no climate change. Basically, it's because all this cold water flowing south 
And if it's colder water, that means also probably colder temperature really localized in this area here. And it's all around the east coast of Canada and east coast of US, and we've seen that since a few years now. So it's a complex system. Uh, I'm just showing that because a lot of uh, food or phytoplankton productivity in the Arctic is linked to limitation in, uh, in light. And that's just like the northern part of Canada, it's alert. And you can see there's five months of light and five months with absolutely no light. So it's the, this midnight uh, sun, it's there. And it's only from Reykjavik in Iceland down. It's exactly the distance from the border of Canada to the border of Mexico, a few hundred kilometers. So, and from there, you have an area south that have five months of light, and an area there's no midnight sun. So a lot of difference in the Arctic uh, about uh, light intensity, and it will have an impact on productivity at the same time. And you've probably seen these graph a lot of time about the decrease of ice extent. Sorry. So on your left, you get the average uh, monthly Arctic sea ice extent from August 79 to 2015. And you can see there's a clear decrease up to that was uh, two weeks ago when I downloaded this graph. Uh, that's only the annual, the by season here, May, June, July to September. And there's a lot of ice, and you can see there's a clear decrease annually. But that was the lowest record, 2012. And if you can see, there was a week ago. Uh, it's just here, 2015. It's in blue. And we're below the mean of this uh, area here, the gray zone here. It's the, um, it's better on my graph, sorry. It's the, um, the standard deviation. So it's already below uh, in September than what it's supposed to be the mean from 79 to 2015. So really, the ice extent is decreasing. So when we look at this map, it's probably more visual, this one. That was uh, the end of August, August 2015. This is what the ice in the Arctic looked like. Uh, there's a lot of thick ice here. That is the median. And you can see already for August 2015, it's way uh, shrink a lot with some area in the high Canadian Arctic still with a lot of ice. But when you look at this, it's like a full pack. It's thin pack. But in reality, this is what it's looked like. So you have some, almost some open sea with no ice, some sludge, I think we say, really uh, sludgy area. And suddenly you have some, the pack ice start, and eventually the full ice where you can walk. So there's, and all this, it's on the one kilometer. So you can see different type of light can enter the water and change fully the biology of the water column and eventually what's happening on the seafloor, which is what I'm looking for. Uh, so, and this kind of situation, it's more and more frequent. Usually it was just a big line, a little bit of sludge, that's it. But now there's breaking more and more inside of the, uh, the ice pack every year. I just want to highlight this. There was this paper in, uh, in Nature, full number, uh, full volume of Nature about what is going to happen after the ice is gone in the two polar region. And from there, following this, there's plenty of paper talking about <coughs> biodiversity. I just want to highlight this then. Biodiversity, Arctic seems a good mix, at least in Canada, to get money. So I decided to merge both the Arctic and biodiversity and see what is going to happen on these quite particular species living with no light since a few uh, thousand years and suddenly getting more and more free open uh, water. But just a few facts about Canada. First, Canada got the longest coastline of the world. It's 16% of the coastline of the world is Canadian coast. Uh, we're 32 million, so that's short and it's difficult to cover everything. And just to 10% of the 16%, not of the 16, but 10% of the coastline of the world, it's inside of the Canadian Arctic. 10% of the coastline of the world. So, and many of places there, there's never been a human who walked there, at least then we know of, uh, maybe at the military side, but no scientists, we have no data, nothing. And also, the Arctic, it's, uh, the Canadian Arctic, it's covered with at least three meter uh, thick ice for up to 60% of the time. So it's not easy to work there and go there. And, uh, many, and, and I showed this slide a few times to politicians in Canada and also to decision maker because we have a, our flag. It's, there's a definition of our flag. I'm doing a small history course here for Canada. So it's mean one coast to the other. But we forget one. So usually 
because I'm the, from the French speaking side, everyone will think that we'll talk about Quebec freaking, uh, speaking, French speaking side. But I said we should change the Canadian flag for this kind of flag and have one ocean to another one to the other one. So, uh, and uh, let's make the, everyone laugh because usually Quebecers like to show their flag and I'm not showing it. So just to, to mention then Canada, because of the Arctic, the difficulty to work there, we got only one scientific icebreaker uh, and it's dedicated to research in the Arctic. Uh, that's great, but with 10% of the coastline of the world in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic only, that's not that much effort so far. So um, we decided also to show then, mostly for the people in Canada, they live quite far from the Arctic. A lot of them never been there. Uh, it's so expensive. It's four times the price from where I live to here then from where I live to the Arctic. It's $4,000 a plane ticket to get there. So you can do a, a round trip around the world. So what we decide, it's also to show to the people in the Arctic, it's not that isolated, and it's not that poor div in diversity. When I say that, the people say, oh yeah, look, there's few marine mammals, few fish, that's true. But marine mammals and fishes, at least in Canada, represent less than 1% of the species. So that's not that many. But when we start to look and try to get the same effort by each zone, and we know pretty well the eastern part of Canada, uh, which is really the, the Grand Banks of Canada, it's well known. And when you look at the number of phytoplankton species, even if we remove the Hudson Bay, where we have no data, we got more than 1,000 species of phytoplankton in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic, compared to 625, 26, and 482 in the western, in the Pacific, Canada. So suddenly, when you add this, you need a lot of marine mammal and fish to reach the same level. So the vision, it's totally different when we have the same effort from each zone. So it's not so poorly diverse. Uh, when we look at the infauna only, not only the species living inside of the sediment, in the case of the Arctic, when we wrote this article, we managed to collect only 53 meters square. So 53 meters square will be probably, I will say, one Canadian kitchen. Uh, so I will say probably the size of this side of the room. So we collect only for this size of the room, 53 meter, and it's again, we were close to a thousand species, where when you look at the Eastern Canada, we've got three times this size, and we're still a hundred, a thousand and one hundred and fifty amount. So it's not that a huge difference between the Arctic and again, Eastern Canada, or even Western Canada, where we have at that time we did not manage to collect enough sample. So, but when you look at marine mammal, it's, there's less in the Arctic, less in Eastern, uh, more in Eastern Canada and Western Canada. When you look at the zooplankton, again, it's quite similar, uh, except Western Canada got more. Microalgae, lower, definitely. And when you had the microbes uh, to all of this, so the Canadian Arctic, what we manage along this list here, it's close to 3,000 quite comparable to the eastern and more temperate zone. So the goal was really to show to then it's not so low in diversity when we try to be comparable to each different zones. And, but we don't know how many species are at risk. We don't know how they change. It changed really rapidly. Uh, and we know then some marine mammal already disappear in some area of the Canadian Arctic and also a little bit more subarctic. We used to have a, a kind of sea otter in Canada. Uh, very few people know that. It's just been extinct, totally extinct from the east part of Canada. Uh, walrus was south at the level of Boston. Very few people know that. There was the largest walrus population in the world was in the Gulf of St. Lawrence down to Halifax and close to Boston. They are not there anymore. They have been instinct by the French when they colonize. They use uh, walrus that was a better fat, it seems, than, and send that back to the um, US, uh, US, but European market. So, but when we work in the Arctic, uh, and it's just like to show, I like this one, that's uh, a one that we just discovered a few years ago. We discovered plenty of new species and we don't have the time to write all these papers. We've got plenty of jars and describing new species, it's not so rewarding. It's take a lot of time. It's never in big impact journal, but this one, it has been found specifically and we decided to give him a, a name of a Inuit name, a traditional tools. 
then you see the, the, the shape of the tools is to make some hole and start fire for them. Uh, and it's exactly one of the criteria of the species. So the Inuit were really happy then the, the worm, this polychaete worm, it's made from our traditional tool from the Arctic. But the Greenland said, we don't spell it the same way, so please change your name. So that's uh, <laughs> because we have also a claim, claim between Greenland and Canada in some area. And we have plenty of other species like this to describe. We have a new order of um, enteropners never seen on the planet. We're describing it presently. So, but, sorry, with the Canadian effort, we decided to try to have a, a Pan-Arctic view. So myself and Dieter Pippenberg decided to uh, call all these uh, colleagues and collect as many benthic data as possible, any kind of benthic data from the picture, grab, trawls, whatever, and try to compile this uh, between 50 and 500 meters deep and try to have a, an overview of the Arctic in general. And you can see that's the, the Arctic, the, the North Pole will be here, Greenland, Alaska will be just here. And I just want to show that then there's a lot of uh, effort in the Barren Sea, the White Sea, uh, a lot in the Chukchi Sea, a little bit in the Bering Sea, very few in the I Canadian Arctic, and even in, in general in the Arctic. I'm the only one benthic ecologist. There's one or two, but mostly focusing on one or two species or a group. But there's very few uh, uh, um, ecosystemic benthic ecologists in the Arctic. And uh, it's same thing with Greenland. It's more difficult. So just as an overview of the during this paper, how much effort we managed to collect from around these different eco region. And uh, yeah, we collect more than close to uh, 400, 4,000. Uh, 500 station, 20 different uh, source of data from 1956 to 2009. That's with a range of gear, etc. And on this graph, we just show the, the mollusk, the arthropod, and the echinoderm, and all these different eco region here, the number of sample, and you're probably familiar with this kind of uh, rarefaction curve, and you see that there's known of these seems to reach an asymptote. There's still plenty of space for people to work in the Arctic. You're all welcome. Uh, and so the total uh, we manage with a few, uh, with a nice database called Worms. I think most of you know that. So we use Worms and a lot of different countries use the same different name. So we manage to really standardize all the name. We start with close to 4,000 and we reach 2,600 uh, with this showing all the different aspects of each country, naming their name differently. Uh, and the estimation will be to 4,600 for the most arthropod and echinoderms. So that's exactly the, the same graph, but in this case, it's the observe. And we use the KO2, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with this. I will show what is this uh, index after. But the highest diversity was found in the Barents Sea, which is also the highest intensely sample area, and the lowest, it's East Greenland, which is also the lowest sampling. So there's definitely a link between sampling and uh, the number of species we can observe here. So this is why we decided to use these KO index. Uh, and the KO index, it's an expected number of species which will be observed for an infinite number of samples. So it's like a prediction how many species, if you have the time to sample everywhere, how many species you should observe. And you can see then suddenly it's mostly the Beaufort Sea, which is between Alaska and Canada, uh, got a really high um, uh, number of species expected. Uh, same thing with the north of Labrador, which is just here, getting out just here uh, from the Arctic. Uh, and most of the group, except East Greenland, stay relatively low. Uh, and um, North Barren, there's an increase, but not that much. So really, there was a link with the sampling effort and the number of species we observe. So when we look at that, we estimate then we're still 28% of species are still unknown, at least for these three group in the Arctic. Using the same kind of data for the Canadian Arctic, and one of the questions I showed earlier, it's what is going to explain, and there's this Probably you've seen this guy, this ump shape curve or bell shape. I don't know how you call it here. Uh, then if you increase your productivity, and here we use chlorophyll as a proxy, 
with species diversity, then you reach in a, a plateau in the middle and you have a decrease and there's too much food and there's different reasons for that. I don't want to go into theory here. But when you look at that, it was fitting most of the textbook. We were happy. We managed to publish that. And a few years ago, we start, not a few years, but just two, three years ago, I decided to go back and we saw that most of the downside here was nothing to do with productivity, but it's low salinity area. At the first look, it never looked at, it was salinity, but with the high smelting in the Arctic, we start and more and more to see probably some change in these species, probably more nutrient and of light, you get a lot of production, but all these group, it's in low salinity area. So we were quite surprised and that's what bring us the idea, okay, that's a part, it's probably linked to productivity, chlorophyll A, and also to salinity. So what is going to happen if what happening in the Baffin Bay, really between Greenland and Canada, this is where are the most of the fresh uh, water ice is, it's, and it's melting at a really fast pace, and what is going to happen to all these benthic species and even to the ecosystem in general. Uh, but I just want to show here then the salinity from the 1920 to 2000 just changed, and that's the surface here. Don't look at this graph, just this one you will see. And you see a switch of, um, yeah, from the salinity from here to suddenly to fresh and fresher uh, through time. So really the melting of the glacier in Canada and Denmark seems, or Greenland seems to bring uh, more fresh water in the system, and most of our species were coming from there uh, with this uh, signal of the down curve. So we decided to start uh, to try to understand a little bit more what is going to happen in this area. And this is, I'm going to show you two different um, theory about what is, it, what is going to happen when the ice will retreat from the Arctic. So the first one is from Carol, Carol and Vassman. Uh, here you have the, the actual scenario where you have a lot of ice with the uh, summer period here. You have a lot of ice algae sinking to the seafloor. A little bit of phytoplankton when the, uh, when the light is there. And the phytoplankton will start to be consumed by zooplankton in the water column. And the benthos will receive more feces and pseudofeces from at the end, but a lot of fresh material from the ice algae. So the algae growing under the ice straight at the beginning. And this is why I put the box higher for sea ice algae getting to the benthos and the phytoplankton uh, will have uh, the zooplankton to consume it. And in general, Carol and, uh, Carol and Carol and Vassman call this a benthic driven system because when the ice algae just fall from the ice, they are like a flock. They are going really, they are sinking really rapidly to the seafloor so the benthos receive a lot of fresh material. And they propose then with less ice like here, what is going to happen, the ice algae are going to be distributed on a longer period of time. Phytoplankton will have more light, so more phytoplankton for a longer period of time. And zooplankton will become to play an important role and start to heat the phytoplankton. So, and they said that will become not, more, not anymore a benthos driven system in the Arctic, but a zooplankton driven system to, and sending that to the seafloor, so the benthos will receive more feces, pseudofeces, not the same kind of fresh material. This is what they propose um, as, a, as a theory, what is going to happen in the future. So really a shift from the sea ice algae, so the benthos to phytoplankton and zooplankton are going to be the driven system now. But at the same time, there's Rizgat and Glun who published this one in Biogeoscience, and in their case, they said that's the ice-free season, a small period, Presently, they showed in their data that you have a, a really a synchronized synchronization between the phytoplankton and the zooplankton period, uh, and you get a, a lot of material getting to the seafloor, but one peak in general. But with the ice-free season, because the water stay cold, all these copepods are not going to grow faster enough, and they propose then the phytoplankton and in this case, also the ice algae are going to reach the benthos, and uh, the benthos will benefit from that, from fresh water, uh, not fresh water, from fresh export of phytoplankton and ice algae, and grow faster. So they propose that this is what, what is going to happen uh, for a while in the Arctic. So we decide to try to test this hypothesis. 
using a bivalve and sclerochronology. Uh, I don't know if the people are familiar with sclerochronology. It's when we, uh, trees, you know, when we cut a tree, there's some band for growing. So this is exactly what we're using, but with uh, a species of bivalve called astarte. It's widely distributed in the Canadian Arctic and also at a Pan-Arctic scale. So we, the first part was to test if it's work. And we know then all the, what I showed, and Rysgaard and Bloom showed and their model of work for this area here. So we said, let's go back where Glund and uh, Riesgaard, just the, the group before, just show this and see if it's true. Is it working? Is it for a long period of time? So we use this bivalve as a proxy using sclerochronology and also sclerochemy or sclerochemistry uh, to study the chemical element in the biogenic art tissue of the aquatic organism, status or trace element, etc., to see if there's a, a match here. So we're focusing on one area. It's a polynia. It's called the Northwater Polynia. It's a well-known polynia in the Arctic. It's called also the Serengeti of the, of the Arctic in general. And a lot of the life of the Canadian Arctic and even around Greenland start from this point in particular because there's no high, even in the middle of the winter, for a small, in a small area with plenty of, um, of narwhal, belga whales, seabirds staying in the Arctic. So when we sample at one station, close to 600 meters deep, uh, and we collect plenty of this bivalve in this area. So that's the bivalve, and uh, the people here are probably familiar with this. But, and after we did this uh, cross-section of 150 and 60 microns, that's just an example, and you can clearly see these growth beds. I think I've had something to, and each one, we calibrate them and see if there was really an increment by here, and it's exactly an increment so, uh, by here, and we can see them. So we decide to do that for uh, a few bivalves and to look in this area, and they can live up to 103 years old. So when you look at this kind of bivalve, so you know that you collect them, that was this year, and you can go back in time. So it's exactly like adding a mooring, a full mooring, uh, measuring temperature, salinity, etc., in one place for the last 103 years old. So that was our goal. Not all of them are 103, uh, so we managed to get down to all the, the same, which is around 70 years old. So what we did, we look at a growth, and this is the, uh, the growth index. Uh, and if you're above zero, that's a positive growth. If you're below, that's a negative growth based on different um, growth model for all these bivalves. They are coming from 15 uh, specimen of the Astarte from 1950 up to 2010. And I just draw your attention here to the last 10 years where we have only some positive uh, growth of most of our Bible, even all of them, the, the 15, it's a positive growth. So we can believe that with the climate change, that can be a question of temperature, salinity, or food. So we did some oh. Uh, profile for these, uh, for at least three specimens. We've, when we, uh, when I, we use this graph, we only had three, but we did all of them. And as you can see, there's no real pattern in salinity uh, and temperature. And this is confirmed also with this area, which is quite known because it's a Polynia area uh, with a 10-year uh, mooring data uh, of the seafloor, and there's no uh, change on the bottom temperature and salinity, so it seems that the temperature and salinity are not factor, but it will be more food dynamic uh, availability in this area than even at 600 meter, these uh, bivalves seems to receive something from the surface, which seemed to be higher in the last 10 years. So we did some fatty acid profile. That's not my expertise, that's someone in the group. So if you ask me some question, I will try to do my best. Uh, but if you have some specific question about the name of these uh, different fatty acid, it will be quite difficult for me. But what I want to highlight here, it's then 39%, almost 40% of what we measure are fatty acid linked to phytoplankton or dinoflagellate. We don't know it's a, if it's ice algae 
or phytoplankton. That's our next step using IP25, a new marker. Then we are presently in the lab looking at these markers. We never tried them before. There's a few teams uh, in Canada who try it and also in Europe. Uh, so that's the next step to differentiate between phytoplankton and ice algae. But definitely these bivalves, there's a strong pelagic benthic coupling here uh, with phytoplankton and ice algae, uh, even by 600 meters. So, and we're in the open uh, time, there was no ice, so we will expect there's less getting to the seafloor and because they are heating by the, the, the zooplankton, which is in not the case uh, here. So, yeah, the main feeding source of this uh, filter feeder seems to be microalgae from the ophritic zone down to 600 meter. But is it true? So if it's the case, that means there's more phytoplankton at the surface. So we use this paper uh, from a colleague and a co-author of the other paper. So they look at the primary production for the last 13 years with a sea wave time series. And I just want to draw the, the story is where the bivalve is coming from. And you can see here then we got more, when it's um, red, there's more production than before for the same date. And when it's in the blue zone, there's less production than inside of the 13 years. So what you can see is there's a more early bloom of phytoplankton, which is exactly going with the climate change. There's the ice is retreating earlier during the summer. So we have a phytoplankton bloom, but it seemed not to stay really long. And after that, we have totally the opposite. We have less phytoplankton in general in the area and even a little bit upstream here, then usually don't, there seems to have less phytoplankton in the area in general, but these bivalve eating more phytoplankton or diatom uh, or um, ice algae and growing faster. So that's still a question mark we try to understand. So that's going more on the side than uh, um, Risgard and Glun about the, the benthos will benefit from this. But when we look at the panarctic scale, um, we see this is our area here in blue, but most of the Arctic got more phytoplankton, more production in the last 13 years in general, except in the area where we're sampling. So if we try to extrapolate what we see, that may be totally wrong because you can see then the rest of the Arctic, it's more positive in phytoplankton than uh, the area where we're sampling. So when we look, we go back to this model, we have more time and Carol and Vassman proposed this, but definitely for our site, that's not what's happening. Probably for some other area, that's fit the, the, these two. We cannot exclude both, but we believe then, because of the complexity of the Arctic and the Earth, we need a more local approach uh, in a pan-Arctic context. Definitely there's some area which got totally different because of the complexity of the area. We cannot generalize to the Arctic about these large um, theory or system than they proposed. So changing the ice will also bring some major threat in general in the Arctic. So from an ice condition to ice free condition, there's plenty of fleas for fishing uh, the Greenland halibut now in the Arctic along the Baffin. There's this race for between Canada and US and the Beaufort Sea. There's also Greenland, it's starting to drill uh, in the Baffin Bay for oil. More shipping activities and also coastal erosion because of the loss of um, I think this is the word in English, the frozen ground, permafrost, sorry, per, sorry, that's my French. Um, I just say I will say it with an English accent, they will probably understand, that's not the case, <laughs> sorry. I tried that with, the, with Spanish, it's worked a lot in French, but not in English, sorry. Um, <laughs> So why I'm showing that, it's uh, basically because we increase our sampling effort in the Arctic in the, over the last few years. Even Canada received uh, Laval University, uh, where then my PhD just received a 20 million per year for the next seven years, only to increase the sampling in the Arctic. Uh, because Canada is claiming some region and they want to be ready when they are going to be at the international court to make their case. So as a scientist, that's great, uh, but if we go for oil, mining, and infrastructure. This is what Canada wants to go. This is all the project. They are underway presently from 2013 to 2020. There's more than 25 different projects only with an Arctic component in the Canadian Arctic. So that's a lot when we used to have only 10, 11 ships. Uh, now that's a lot. 
that's more than one per week in some area. That's really, and that's going to break the ice all the time, all year round to get the mineral and the oil out of there. So that's mean all the Inuit also, there's a lot of uh, uh, cultural uh, debate because they're using the ice as the highway to travel to one village or the other. And if the, the icebreaker break the ice once a week, that's mean they're not going to travel from one side to the other side. So they are going to uh, break part of their culture to exchange from one village to the other and even to go hunting. So this is what looked like in August 2013, all the ships who crossed around the world. Uh, there's a lot of shipping activities, but still there's a lot here in the entrance of Canada and the Northwest Passage a little bit, and it's along the coast here of Greenland. So more and more activities. And this is what Smith and Stevenson proposed in the PNSA journal. That will be by 2040 and 2059. That will be the two major routes to cross from Europe to uh, Asia or to east part of North America to Asia through here. Just the red line, it's only a different type of ship which can handle different type of ice. So in by 2040, these class of ship can cross totally the North Pole and go straight to Asia. So with all these more and more activities, uh, it started because I like biodiversity, but biodiversity it's also potential invasive species with ballast water in the Canadian Arctic and anywhere around the world, not only the Arctic. But we know then uh, aquatic exotic species could cause extension in some other area of the world. Uh, they arrive with of falling or ballast water. We have a good example here of ballast water getting out. Uh, we have the coastal estuarine species, many of them. So I showed you before, there's more and more freshening of the uh, Arctic. That may be also problematic. And most of them are algae and invertebrate, rapid dispersion, and the influence many trophic level. So that's one of the Canadian port now. They used to go to Montreal to send all the grain the cereal from the prairies go to Montreal. They are not doing that anymore. They send that to the Arctic. It's faster to bring that to the Russian market and the American market. And there's a ship now all year round getting to Churchill to get the Canadian cereal or grain. And I will guess probably also some of the American one go there too. So what we decide to do uh, is to start to work in this port and look if there were some invasive species and do a baseline survey uh, of four of the major ports, that's the three of them, Churchill uh, for the grain, Deception Bay, Iqaluit, uh, there are two other major ports. And we also sampled an area where they want to create the, large, the largest mine in the Arctic Circle, and that's going to be in this area just here. So we, they are building the mine presently, there's very few ships going there, so we decide to do also a sampling in this area as a baseline. So I'm not going to the detail of all the results we got, but what is important here is that when we sample, and by the way, it's only six meters square we managed to sample, because the window to sample is really short. It's not easy to work there. It's really expensive. Uh, just to give an idea, 30 days, a team of diver, 10, 10 person, it's $100,000. Uh, and in US and Canadian, because that will be only 50. So, but. It's really expensive, so we try to focus on some area with a team. And uh, so what we see here is that there's different port, and most of these are, have been found in within region. So using the database you saw before for the full Arctic, uh, at the Pan-Arctic scale, we can see are these species were present at the Arctic, outside of the region, a part Arctic zone, in the surrounding area, or within the region from the historic database and also to look if they have a wider distribution, etc., or eventually, if they are not seen, we don't know the species, we call that cryptic, cryptogenic species. So, and for these port, we see around between 1.5 to 4% of cryptogenic species. Uh, we have a total of 287 species, only for the intertidal zone, and really shallow subtidal. Uh, and there's a correlation, but the largest port with international link, it's Deception Bay, so this one with 4%, and the one they just start, uh, even the mine is not starting, it's the lowest one. We don't know if it's a, it's a correlation, there will be nothing to do, but there's still something to explore there. 
So and what we found, and even if we have plenty of species never recorded in the area, most of them have been recorded by historical data in the same area. And many of other, around 5 to 10% of all these groups, uh, it's probably just an increased effort survey. Many of the people never sampled there, so it will be not fair to say they are new in the area. So they are really uh, probably an increased survey. And these one we're doing presently some genetic of all these species to see if they are cryptogenic new species, what are they? But also the Arctic, it uh, can receive a lot of these potential exotic species, but uh, eight of these species have been identified as established non-indigenous species in some other area of the world, or considered as cryptogenic, or they are questionable where they're coming from in some other area. And for example, the Port of Deception Bay and Equalwit are linked to the east coast of Canada and US. They are linked to Australia. They are linked to Russia. And they are linked to the mid, mid sea also. So the Arctic can also send some potential exotic species. And these are the ones that we can find in different areas around the world, close to eight. So really, it's, a, it's a, also a potential source of non-indigenous species. So what we decide to do now is uh, to help different managers uh, what they should do uh, and where the area are at risk. So we did the now, but during the PhD of uh, one of my students, Jessica, we look at what is on the future. So we, we, we did this to, to predict the habitat sustainability of a suite of known invasive species connected to the Canadian Arctic port and to assess the likelihood of established under both current and future climatic scenarios. So species chosen, we've chosen a few of them. We've chosen them because they are connected to Arctic port. We found them in the ballast water in different stage. Uh, their biological char characteristic and their invasive history in North America or anywhere else in the world. So maybe you know some of them, the Japanese skeleton, the green crab, the soft shell clam, the periwinkle, uh, the bay barnacle, this baryozoan, coffin box baryozoan, the red king crab, and these tunicate here. So we decided to use these eight different species. And just for ex as an example, we did that for all of them, but I will follow the next three slides are going to be only about the green crab. So here we see the uh, native range in green and the introduced range in general it's along the, the east coast of uh, the US and the west, east coast and west coast uh, and this native range is usually in Europe and have been introduced in other area of the world. So we decide to use the NOAA and these two a uh, nice environmental characteristic from these two sources uh, for temperature, salinity, highest coverage, highest concentration, bathymetry. And we model that through Maxent, uh, a program that is used quite to look at species distribution and habitat sustainability. And we test them and we validate uh, our uh, model in the different area of the Canadian Arctic. That's and after that, we use, uh, in collaboration with the University of Manitoba in Canada, we use uh, one of their models to use a projection up to 2015 here with the scenario of the IPCC, uh, the 4.5, which is the middle scenario of climate change. We didn't use the two extreme, we use the middle one with a good resolution. And we use, again, the, the same parameter. So here, this is what, where the green crab it's a potential. This isn't where is the green crab, but this is the potential sustainable habitat in general in the Arctic. So we know we find it up to here, up to here in general, not air, but you see then there's some sustainable habitat for the green crab already in the Arctic. So that's the actual distribution, that's the introduced range, and also the green represent the predicted if it's now. So this is the future range using the scenario, the IPCC for 2015. And you see then suddenly there's some appearance of potential sustain, uh, 
adequate and sustainable habitat for the green crab uh, in different other area. And we s just put both together. And now we can see there's some expansion in different area. Oh, sorry. <coughs> yep, that's the one. So we put both together. And we can see there's some habitat where the green crab can, in the future, can establish because all the conditions are fine. So the green, again, the green represents the present one. If it was today, but it's only a potential. Sustainable, the present and the future are the gray one together and only the future, so we really have an expansion in general to the north. So, yeah, this is just the, uh, the mean where, and it will expand in the next to 2050, more than 141 kilometer north. That's a gain of close to 7% of his actual habitat. So we did that for, especially for the Canadian Arctic, to help to create some regulation about ballast water exchange. Uh, so far, all the ship, they have no re official regulation, but they try to change in this area, their ballast water. But most of the time, they arrive in Canada empty. And it's difficult to change their ballast water because they will be unstable in this area. So they don't do it totally as it's recommended, and it's not an enforcement, it's only a recommendation. So after that, they enter and do it directly at the port. And I remind you that Churchill is just here, and the current is doing this. So this is a potential uh, area. So we did that for all these eight species, and I'll go fastly through. In general, we have all mostly a Cold War trend. All the species, when we look at the future, they're all going more to the, the, to the pole. Uh, most of them gain some habitat, 1 to 12% of their habitat, except the caprella here, which seems to decrease by 10.5% is habitat. So the Safsham clam, it's already present here. This is where all these group of species can appear in the Beaufort and the Chokchi Sea and the Arctic complex. Actually, they can be there. And in the future, the three of them can be in boat. Same thing for in the future, all these groups can be in the Hudson complex uh, and also uh, these one. So from there, uh, the Arctic is changing on the climate change, but also on the human pressure. Uh, and that's just the take home message here. There's still a lot of species to discover, as you can see. Uh, it's difficult to know if they were invasive, new, or it's just a lack of sampling. Uh, the Arctic, before there was the gold rush, now it's the gold Arctic or the Arctic rush. Uh, so many countries want to work there. Um, and there's a lot of activities going on in, in the Canadian side. And I can list also a lot in the Alaskan side. It's quite similar too. Uh, we don't have in Canada official monitoring program for the Arctic, which is quite sad. Uh, but we need to have these kind of monitoring, the, some species, and the ecosystem functioning is crucial if we have to have adequate uh, decision uh, at this stage. And the global change and anthropic resource are rising very quickly, especially in the Arctic. Uh, we need effective protection measure and a holistic approach. So, so far, it's only a small, small initiative, uh, except when you are in a icebreaker, but when we're working from shore, benthic ecologist goes, and we have very few people from oceanography coming with us, and it's, they're going mostly at sea. It's easier for them. So we need to have a better connection there to be sure that not only them working on a icebreaker, it's easy, I will say in general, compared to working on the shore in the Arctic, and we need both now to, if we want to meet some of these uh, protection measures in the future. So thank you.
to sample inside the ballast water, to sample inside of the side of the ship, and they want to know that it's there. Because they want to have a great relationship with, with the human. And most of the human are really scared. Some of these species, for example, I'm going to talk about the uh, Chinese middle crab. The Chinese middle crab, it's, uh, I don't know if you know the species, but it's traveling a lot in history. And its favorite food is salmon egg. So you can imagine the Inuit are eating a lot of Arctic char. If one of these bees get there, they are going to be really sad because they're using the river just at their entrance. The next river is really far, so they will need to change their own their way to hunt to get their food. So this is why these companies are really more uh, helping us than the Canadian government actually does. Uh, the Canadian government wants to have more economy. So if the industry buy the idea, the Canadian, the actual government will say yes, but it is back in the house. So, and this is why in the last uh, kind of like claim, this area I showed in the beginning, this is why they try to increase our presence in the Arctic by giving a little bit more money to the scientists to get in the Arctic and sample because when we're there, it's showing that the presence in the Arctic and we're allowed to rescue. It's all these four different criteria I showed and we need to do some mapping. So, the same time. so we need to they give some money, but if you have six hours a day just for mapping, and after you can do your work, so they are expanding their horizon because it's only seven to eight percent of the Canadian Arctic, which is <coughs> so it's not a lot. As a chief scientist, sometimes you try to say to the captain, "Can you go left a hundred meters? There's no ice." He said, "We don't have any chart there, Phil. We're not going to cross. We're crossing the water, the ice instead, because if we go there, if we hit something." Nobody can come and rescue us for the next few days. So what do you mean? We can go a little bit, and every year they go on the side slowly and increase their coverage. Uh, the scientists are paying, so this is why I want to be in the, in the open water, we can move faster to the next station to just make all the scientists more happy, but the captain's so never. So it's a delay must be fine. But definitely you're right, we can't even buy it if the industry buys. Yes. And is most of the interest in funding in the near shore, and what kind of depths are they reaching out to, or is it going all the way out to the... It's mostly out shore, offshore. Okay. Most of the work is offshore. This is what is sad, because we have very few inshore. Uh, the villages are quite isolated from each other, and for a lot of scientists, it's not easy to work uh, in some area, because you need to bring your own helicopter, and there's no runway. So there's a lot, a lot of difficulty to work there, and you need to have the approval of the ultra council of each village. So that's when you go, you need to go there five to ten days before, the year before, mention what is the project. If you have an approval with the with council, now you can go back and get the project. But are you going to ask for money before you get the approval? So there's this loop which is difficult. Uh, and we try through the icebreaker, which is easy, because you're dealing with all the community in one time. That's the easiest way, so they most, and I'm not dealing with it, it's an organization called ArcticNet, which is dealing with that for me. So I don't need to do anything. So, but if I go short, we're doing that for the, uh, each village, I need to go back also in November and decalibrate uh, to see the decalibrate under concept. That was only to show what we did last year. And I, we did that last year, and the year before we went there just to show what we did. So we need to hire them, we need to, it, it's a lot of complexity. Even for the food sometimes, they don't want to eat our food. So they want to eat seal, they want to eat what they got there, and it's difficult. I like pasta, but they don't eat pasta, so it's, it's a challenge sometimes. So we need to hire them, we need to hire their food, and it's become really expensive. When you are on the icebreaker, it's a Canadian government paying for the icebreaker, and I just need to pay for my student, my research. So I will say most of us take the easier routes of time. But definitely, we need, this is why we need a more holistic view. We don't have the short view that much. And that's sad, really sad. <coughs> you, you have, there's a little time series on the physical data, but you said there's a little monitoring data in, in the Not the biology itself. Is there any plan? Yes, there's a, since the last 14 years, there's a, what we call a network called Arctic Net. It's at the center of the icebreaker, uh, the Canadian Research Icebreaker Amundsen. And we're doing all the same route. 
for six weeks per year, and the rest is for a new initiative or new project. And during these six weeks, we're assembling always the same squad. Biology, physical, chemistry, uh, vectors, or plankton, et cetera. So that's the only monitoring program, but it's one point per year in August. That's not a real vision of what's happening in the Arctic. Like we show everything can change really rapidly. Uh, so that's the best monitoring program. We have plenty of moorings, which is good, but we don't have the biology itself, the benthos. And I'm interested in I don't think it's well covered. Uh, in addition to the loss of ice, there's also a trend towards inner ice. Is that something that might also have an effect on the benthos? That's a really good, uh, when the ice has become thicker or less tender, sorry. Tender, you have more light getting through, you have a little bit more phytoplankton. And there's a few really good papers showing that even some phytoplankton blooms start as soon as you have less slope and the ice is thinner. So the productivity starts earlier in the system. That may be an option and really a big uh, impact. And very few people measure that. There's a, a really nice paper in the churches about that, showing that it's happening close to a few weeks earlier, and that would be a major impact. That's really good. Um, thank you for speaker.